University. She uh, became a vegetarian as a child, which is a fascinating story. If you can actually get her to quite humorous to, to tell you that one. Um, has been a raw vegan for 19 years, a uh, natural hygienist. And um, she also has classical and metaphysical training in counseling and worked with people healing from disordered eating for over 20 years. And today she's going to be speaking to you about the social and emotional effects of, of diet and lifestyle. And um, I guarantee you this is really an amazing lecture. Um, and she's one of the most brilliant women I've ever gotten to know. So I, I really hope that you enjoy it. Um, Professor Rosalind Graham. Thank you. Lenny, I feel so humbled by the introduction. I just hope I can live up to 1% of it for you. Um, my topic today, I really do feel, is so important and really truly valuable for those of us who are trying to make dietary improvements and particularly those of us who are not necessarily finding that journey particularly an easy one. Um, how many people in the room have actually woken in the morning with an intention to eat in a certain way and by the time they've gone to bed that night are thinking, oh well I'll start again tomorrow? <laughs> um, is there also anybody in the room who has ever felt in a social situation challenged as to how best to deal with it in a diplomatic way? Yeah? Okay, right, well, hopefully then, most of you are in the right session at this point, because that's what we're going to talk about. I have very short time, actually, to share with you what is actually a very large amount of information, so I'm going to be quite concise. I hope to allow a little bit of time for questions at the end. Um, where I'd like to start is actually with my baby daughter, Francesca. Now, the reason I want to start there is because of perhaps alerting you or encouraging you to become aware of how much emotional pain we all may have experienced as children. Now, I know this is kind of going straight in from the get-go, but with just 45 minutes, we don't have much choice for dallying around. So I'm going to be really honest with you. Now, when we look at the baby creatures of the world, we know that some of those baby creatures are able to defend themselves from a very young age to some degree. Now, baby snakes, for example, some of them are actually even more poisonous than the parent snake. It's their way of protecting themselves from predators. A baby zebra can actually get up and run with the herd within a matter of just a few days. But there are certain babies of certain species that are completely and utterly vulnerable to being eaten by a predator unless protected by their parents. And humans fall into this category. Now, if you can imagine my little baby out there, Francesca, just being put down somewhere in a wild natural environment while parent walks off for an hour or so, the likelihood of that infant still being there when you got back, <laughs> yes, it fills you full of the horrors, darling, isn't it, just to think about it. <laughs> right on cue. Um, <laughs> what actually happens is that culturally, just the way we've become so perverted with regard to our food choices, the way that we treat our children and our infants is also vulnerable to that same type of perversion. We consider it normal to take a defenseless little newborn, place it in its little cot, in its separate bedroom where we leave it all night. Or we put it down in point A because it's asleep and we go away and only return when it's already been traumatized and is crying to discover it's on its own. Babies that was you <coughs> once have an inbuilt primordial knowing that the greatest danger as a baby is actually the danger of being eaten. And that is every baby's greatest fear, funnily enough, of being eaten. It might sound bizarre, but that's its true fear. Now, most of us have been brought up in a culture whereby it's considered normal to place our babies in playpens, in separate bedrooms, in pushchairs and cots and prams, and to allow them to awaken to find themselves alone. Now, bear in mind, at that age, alone means anything out of their visual range, which is about six foot, yeah? And so they are repeatedly traumatized with a feeling of not only tremendous fear, but abandonment. Now, in nature, if there is a little creature that is in some way flawed, some way not quite good enough as its siblings, perhaps it's a little bird with a crumpled up wing, and it's there in the nest, and us as compassionate humans, hopefully, 
would want to reach out to that little infant bird and give it a special nurturing, a special care, wouldn't we? But is that what happens in nature? No. It is considered flawed and therefore allowed to perish. The siblings might be allowed to literally kick it out of the nest. The parents may very well not even bother to offer it food or even push it out of the nest themselves so it falls and crashes dead to the ground. That is the tragedy. But is it a tragedy? Because in truth, it's only the strong in every species that proliferate and therefore the species is able to survive as a strong species. We cannot have flawed members of each species reproducing progressively more and more flawed and crippled individuals until the species disappears. And it's the sad truth of nature. And just as much as we have an inbuilt fight or flight response, you know the one that prepares us to run off or fight when we perceive danger, which of course in the old days used to be, you know, the, the predator coming across the hill. In these days it's the bank manager telling you you're overdrawn again, you know. <laughs> you get prepared to fight or run, but hopefully you don't do either. Hopefully what you do is when he tells you that you're overdrawn, you stand there and you go... Because you know your body's preparing itself for physical activity. <laughs> so the very most appropriate thing to do is do that. But the same way, deep down inside of us, we have this belief that if we are being abandoned, it's because we're not good enough. It's because we're flawed. And more to the point, we are literally in danger of being allowed to perish. Now, as we grow up as children, what happens then is that our parents see, them as, uh, see us as an extension of themselves. Because from a point of view of psychology, that's generally what happens. We see our children as an extension of us. And anything we find unacceptable or intolerable with our own behavior, should we see that in that child, we will berate that child voraciously. Because it's something we find intolerable to accept that we actually own ourselves. And so we perpetually hear, don't do this, don't do that, I don't like the way, you shouldn't have done this, you shouldn't have done that, that's not nice, you're a bad girl, you're a bad boy. And so on top of this abandonment that's happened repeatedly, we have now got disapproval as well. And disapproval and abandonment equals you are flawed, you are not good enough, and in fact, you don't deserve your next inhale. And so in a desperate plea, what we try to do is to deliberately act and behave and speak in ways to get our parents' approval and the approval of the superiors around us. We start to dress in ways that will be approved of by our peers at school and later at work. We speak and adopt patterns of language that we think will be approved of. And all the time we're doing this, we're actually building a bigger and bigger facade of who we truly are. Can you see what I mean? Yeah? We start to literally separate ourselves from our own truth as to what we really are like, what we really prefer to wear, how we really prefer to talk and move and be, who we are, and we become a facade. And we're still trying to get the approval of our peers around us and our bosses at work and our relations and our friends and our family. We're still desperate to get some confirmation that we're not flawed, that we're not a lesser person, that we're not in some way different, therefore less capable with less potential than everybody around us. We're desperate for confirmation of this. And so we keep putting up this facade. But by the time we're adults, we have become such a facade of who we truly are that what happens is we have then committed the worst type of abandonment and that's self-abandonment. Because at that point, we don't truly know who we are anymore. We've just put so much energy into this thing of trying to get approval. And when somebody comes up to us and they say, oh, you're such a good listener. You know, I had that problem the other day. You just sat and listened and listened. You're such a good listener. And we puff up our little chest and we say, oh, I'm a good listener. <laughs> the very next day, somebody says, Honestly, you've got no time to listen. All you think about is yourself. I'm always listening to your problems. Can't you listen to mine for a change? And our little chests 